This video is going to cover the evolution of the vertebrate digestive system. Now, before there were vertebrates, clearly there were a number of uh, things that occurred in the evolution of digestive systems, which were quite significant. Uh, when we look at uh, sponges, they do not have what's called extracellular digestion. Uh, they filter feed, um, but when cyanobacteria or you know, small microbes in uh, the seawater uh, pass through these openings, the individual cells have to take the, new, uh, the food up through phagocytosis. So the size of what you can eat is limited by what a cell can ingest through phagocytosis. Um, starting with the uh, cnidarians, uh, the metazoan animals, uh, they now uh, could uh, digest uh, bigger items uh, because they practiced, practiced extracellular digestion. They had a mouth that brought food into a gastrovascular cavity and surrounding the gastrovascular cavity was uh, a, a layer um, and known as the gastrodermis made of endoderm, just as our gut lining is derived from the embryonic tissue endoderm. And this uh, gastrodermis then was rich in digestive enzymes so that larger items uh, could then be uh, ingested and digested in this uh, uh, gastrovascular uh, cavity. Uh, now, uh, cnidarians have one single digestive opening that serves as both the mouth and the anus. Uh, so uh, do uh, flatworms like uh, planaria. Um, but um, uh, worms uh, evolved uh, a complete digestive system where there was a separation between the uh, mouth and uh, the anus, and this was more uh, than efficient. Uh, from animals which had a complete digestive system, uh, we get then the chordates and the vertebrates. And I'd like to now uh, look at their uh, digestive systems um, in uh, two uh, videos. Um, first, uh, when we consider the digestive system, uh, there are two uh, kind of categories of uh, structures. There is the gastrointestinal tract. This is the tube through which food literally passes. Uh, food passes from the mouth into the pharynx, into the uh, esophagus, into the stomach, to the small intestine, to the large intestine. So food travels through those structures. But then there are also other organs included in the system, but food does not pass through them. Food does not pass through salivary glands or through the pancreas or the gallbladder or the liver. These are what are known as accessory structures. These accessory structures uh, are not for the transport of food, but rather their secretions help in the process of um, of uh, digestion. Um, and we can consider uh, uh, these uh, structures uh, from multiple la layers, uh, uh, levels. Obviously, we can look at them under the microscope as uh, well. And so we'll see well, uh, you know, uh, typically in uh, vertebrates, uh, this GI tract has layers, um, and these layers are consistent, not only consistent from, you know, say humans to frogs and fish, but also consistent, you know, when we consider the esophagus compared to the small intestine compared to the stomach. So if you were to cut the GI tract, you would notice these four layers. Um, the food would be passing through the lumen the space in the middle, which is surrounded by the mucosa. Then there would be a submucosa, a muscularis, and a uh, serosa uh, layer. Uh, the uh, mucosa has uh, epithelia, uh, and the type of epithelia would vary. So in the esophagus, for example, we need more protection. So the epithelium is stratified as composed uh, as compared to say the small intestine where we can look at this mammal versus this uh, frog, uh, the epithelium would be simple for secretion and absorption. Now, once again, just note uh, that the human uh, GI tract, not a uh, you know, typical mammal, has a mucosa, submucosa, muscularis, and serosa. And if you were to look at a frog, you see the mucosa, the submucosa, the muscularis, the serosa. You see villi, which increase the surface area of the small intestine in uh, both of them. And so once again, uh, once again, um, there is um, a, a comparable 
um, element, not only comparing, say, uh, different vertebrates, uh, but uh, from one region of the GI tract to uh, another. Uh, so here, once again, uh, we have that simple epithelia lining the small intestine, forming these uh, villi uh, in uh, both uh, frogs and, uh, and mammals. Uh, so uh, the um, mucosa is where a lot of the secretion and uh, absorption occurs. Uh, this is where we're uh, digesting food at a brush border. Uh, the exocrine glands, which form the digestive glands, uh, many are in the submucosa, uh, the uh, next uh, layer. Uh, the third layer has muscle. Now, although there can be some skeletal muscle allowing voluntary control, uh, you know, around, say, the oral cavity and pharynx, so swallowing can be a voluntary uh, action. The external anal sphincter is made of skeletal muscle and allows for voluntary control. Um, the majority of the um, GI tract is lined by smooth muscle. And so this uh, smooth muscle uh, then uh, simply uh, allows uh, for reflexes like uh, the peristalsis that I'll describe with the uh, esophagus, uh, you know, this wave of muscle contraction. Um, finally, we want the GI tract to be free to move, right? And so we find another serous membrane in the GI tract. So when you consider the heart, the heart is not fixed to the lungs. It is in its own separate space, the pericardial cavity, which is lined by a pericardium, which is a serous membrane. The lungs are not attached to the rib cage. They are in their own separate spaces, the pleural cavities lined by the pleura. And in the same way, the digestive system is lined um, by what's called the peritoneum. Uh, like all serous membranes, there are there is a double layer. So the parietal peritoneum forms the um, lining of the ventral body cavity, while the visceral peritoneum is the uh, smooth uh, surface of the organs themselves. And then between the two, this peritoneal uh, cavity is then filled with peritoneal fluid. Um, in addition to the serosa layer, being this serous membrane, which serves as that visceral peritoneum. There can be um, extensions off of that, as we will see in just a second. So here, once again, in the esophagus, we have a stratified epithelium for uh, protection, uh, while in uh, the small intestine, there would be a simple epithelium, uh, which is now uh, functioning in secretion and uh, absorption. So while the mucosa has epithelia, the type of epithelia can vary as one goes from one uh, region uh, to uh, another. Um, there's a bit more in those layers of the GI tract. There is an awful lot of lymphatic tissue. In fact, there can be as many um, uh, white blood cells associated with uh, the GI tract, certainly with mucous membranes, as the rest of the body uh, combined. So not only do we see discrete patches in the tonsils, for example, where it's guarding, you know, the entrances um, where microbes can enter through food and air, we also see uh, lumps of um, uh, lymphatic tissue in the uh, ileum region of the small intestine. Uh, these are known as Peyer's patches. Uh, humans and chimps have an appendix attached to the cecum of the large intestine. But just in general, there is what's referred to as malt, the mucosa associated lymphatic tissue. So um, the digestive tissue of the GI tract is not just for the digestive system. There's also a great a deal of lymphatic tissue here as well, functioning in uh, immunity. Obviously, this needs to be controlled. There are glands in the submucosa which need to be controlled. So neurons would be uh, causing their uh, uh, secretion uh, to be under control. And then obviously in the muscularis region, the muscle needs to be controlled. So obviously neurons are controlling you know, glands in the submucosa, muscle in the muscularis, etc. But interestingly, these uh, neurons uh, are located within the GI tract. 
So the brain and spinal cord really have very little control over digestion. In an emergency, they can, you know, say, hey, don't digest your food right now because we're going to run away. Or, you know, uh, during parasympathetic uh, stimulation uh, at rest, you can maximize digestion. Um, but if you ask, why are enzymes being secreted at this moment? Why is the bolus of food being pushed by these layers of muscle? It's not because the spinal cord said so, or the brain said so. It's because the neurons within the GI tract said so. It is these neurons uh, which are governing digestion, uh, both the secretion of enzymes and the movement of muscle. So the GI tract has its own nervous system, which we can call the enteric nervous system. Uh, and there are as many neurons in the enteric nervous system as there are in the spinal cord. Let me repeat that. When we talk about the, nerv the nervous system, we often talk about the brain, the spinal cord. But once again, this enteric nervous system has as many neurons as the spinal cord. So it certainly is very significant in terms of the number of cells. It is this enteric nervous system which is governing digestion, not the brain and spinal cord. Now, these neurons are decentralized. Uh, they exist kind of just in these nerve nets. And interestingly, just going back to jellyfish, jellyfish have a nerve net around their gastrovascular cavity. They don't have a brain, but you know the reflexes involved uh, in digestion uh, are governed by this nerve uh, net. And since the jellyfish, all animals have that a nerve net around the GI tract, which is largely independent of the brain and spinal cord. So this is arguably not only an important part of the nervous system, but one of the first parts of the nervous system, you know, jellyfish and other cnidarians, they don't have a brain or spinal cord. So the nerve net uh, around the GI tract that uh, goes back, you know, to the earliest nervous systems, even before uh, there was a uh, brain. Now, in addition to the serosa layer forming the visceral peritoneum as, a sur uh, as the surface of um, uh, the digestive organs, uh, there are also then extensions off of the uh, serosa. And so uh, coming from the greater curvature of the stomach, there is an extension known as, an extension known as the greater omentum. Coming off of the lesser curvature of the stomach, there is an extension known as a lesser omentum. Once again, in addition to the visceral peritoneum on the stomach's surface, there is then a membrane extending from it, which helps to anchor it, uh, securing it to other uh, uh, structures um, where blood vessels are contained, etc. Uh, in the folds of the small intestine, there is a mesentery uh, attaching the large intestine to the body wall as a mesocolon, and then uh, separating lobes of the liver and anchoring the liver is a falciform ligament. So these are extensions of the uh, uh, serosa. Once again, these are um, shared among vertebrates. So if you were to then you know, perform uh, you know, uh, look at a cat, uh, then you would see that uh, there are uh, extensions here as well. A mesocolon anchoring the large intestine, mesentery anchoring uh, the uh, small intestine, a lesser omentum between the stomach and liver, a greater omentum, which has a lot of adipose, also known as the uh, fatty apron, a falciform ligament uh, there. And so when one does a dissection, you know, very often you say, what is this stuff? All right, well, here is the shiny surface of the stomach. That is the uh, visceral peritoneum uh, and the body wall is lined by the parietal peritoneum. And so because there is you know, this smooth layer and this smooth layer, the peritoneal fluid that is then filling this cavity allows them to move independently. So there's no friction, there's no blisters and adhesions, et cetera. But in addition to the visceral peritoneum, we have these extensions, the greater omentum, uh, the uh, lesser omentum between the stomach and the liver, uh, falciform ligament uh, between the lobes of the liver, uh, between uh, the... Um, so here, once again, uh, the greater omentum, which can have a lot of adipose in it and be known as the fatty apron. Here you can see the lesser omentum between the stomach and uh, the liver, between the folds of the uh, small 
at intestine, uh, you can see a mesentery attaching the large intestine. You can see a mesocolon uh, and the falciform ligament uh, can anchor uh, the uh, liver. So these are uh, extensions of the uh, serous membranes. And once again, they are uh, shared. And so um, the human uh, digestive uh, tract is not uh, unique. Uh, we saw that all of the same membranes, which we see in um, uh, that we see in humans, we can see in the uh, in the cat. Um, but here uh, we can have a mesentery attaching uh, the uh, intestines of a uh, lamprey. Uh, if you were to look at a shark. Uh, notice once again, there is a, mesen a mesentery attached to the intestines. We would simply call it a mesentery if there's no distinction between the uh, small and large uh, intestine uh, uh, here. So there you can see uh, that, um, uh, that sheet and extension of uh, the peritoneum. Uh, so we can see this in uh, fish. You know, uh, there's the uh, parietal peritoneum. There is a fatty apron with adipose uh, there. There uh, is... Um, uh, you know, these uh, serous membranes. Once again, here you can see the adipose in that uh, greater momentum. When we look at the frog, there's a mesentery in the folds of the intestine, a mesocolon attaching to the large intestine, a lesser momentum coming off the lesser curvature of uh, the stomach, uh, uh, mesentery in the small intestine uh, as well. Uh, here there is the um, and the a peritoneum. And as we go through the vertebrates, once again, uh, these are uh, shared. And so, uh, the you know, once again, the beauty of, of studying vertebrate anatomy, one of the reasons for doing it is that once you know the structures of one vertebrate, uh, then you can go to uh, other vertebrates, such as this opossum, and say, oh, you know, I, I know the uh, extensions of the serosa, which could be uh, identified. And here we see the same in the sheep, uh, the goat, um, uh, the monkey, etc., where the mesentery is uh, between the folds of the uh, small intestine. There's a falciform ligament attaching uh, the liver, uh, etc. Okay. So uh, with that introduction into the GI tract, the layers that all regions share, I'd like to then start uh, with uh, the oral uh, cavity and begin with the process of uh, digestion. Um, now, uh, one of the things I'd like to then uh, stress is how uh, specialized the mouth of mammals is. Mammals are extremely expensive when you compare them to other animals. We're warm blooded, all right? So even in February, our bodies are 100 degrees. That's expensive. We have huge brains, so much bigger than typical animals. Brains are extremely expensive. Even though your brain is only, say, 5% of your body's weight, it can you know, take up, say, 20% um, of your body's energy. We walk upright rather than dragging our bellies on the ground. And so um, our mouths, which we take for granted, um, are actually quite special. I often ask my students, you know, I'll, I'll say, you know, all right, you chew your food. And there's no reaction. But then I, I explain as I will now, just how special that is. Most animals don't chew uh, their food. And this is because mammals are so expensive. So look, for example, at this frog and look at where the nostrils enter, all right? The nostrils enter here, the mouth. So they don't have like an oral cavity and a nasal cavity. So air and food are in the same space. A frog has to make a choice. Should I eat or should I breathe? Because if you just have one space, you can't do both. The same thing with the turtle, all right? Um, but this is then going to be a, there's no nasal cavity and oral cavity. There's just one space here. But we're different because we're expensive. We're going to have to breathe oxygen constantly if we're going to power our metabolism. We're gonna to have to eat so much more than cold-blooded animals will. And we can do both because we have what's called a palate, a hard palate made of two bones, the maxillary and palatine bones fusing, maxillary and palatine. And then there will be a soft uh, mucous membrane palate um, coming from here, which separates 
food in the oral cavity from air in the nasal cavity. So we can do both eat and um, I eat and uh, breathe so that uh, our oxygen uh, supply is not interrupted by eating, which we can now do lots of. Um, so here you can see that this evolved in mammals. So in the armadillo, in the cat, in this opossum, you can see the maxillary and palatine bones in this monkey forming uh, this uh, hard uh, uh, palate. Uh, uh, and so this was something that actually in the mammalian ancestors of um, uh, uh, the synapse and reptiles actually evolved. I'll get back to that. So these cows, um, it, uh, they can feed off of grass, um, but it's going to be hard uh, because, you know, grass is not nutrient rich. So they're going to have to chew a lot. Uh, and one of them, the fascinating things is, I mean, they can because they can be breathing the entire time. Unlike a frog or a turtle, um, the oral cavity is separate from the nasal cavity. And so uh, therefore uh, uh, this supports the, um, the advanced uh, metabolisms of, uh, of mammals. Um, the earliest uh, fish lacked uh, uh, jaws and they lacked uh, teeth. And so as you know, I discussed in the skeletal system, uh, the movement of those gill arches to form jaws, that was certainly very significant. And now uh, the jawed vertebrates could eat larger prey as opposed to the jawless vertebrates, which were you know, largely filter uh, feeders, like maybe swimming and then catching smaller microbes uh, and algae, et cetera, in uh, mucus. Uh, and so jaws were significant as were teeth. The earliest, um, vertebrates did not have teeth. The earliest jawed vertebrates did not have teeth. Even placoderms, they could have, um, here you can see the migration of the early uh, gill arches from jawless fish uh, to form uh, the upper and lower jaws. And then the second gill arch forms a, a supporting structure. So this was arguably one of the most important moments in vertebrate evolution um, because vertebrates changed from being food you know, in, you know, the early Paleozoic, the seas were dominated by invertebrates, sea scorpions, armored squid, and others. Uh, whereas once vertebrates evolved jaws, uh, then they uh, became the tops of uh, food chains. So the earliest vertebrates were uh, jawless, uh, like, you know, the, the fish Hycoichthys and Milocomingium. Um, and from them have descended the jawless uh, vertebrates of today, the hagfish and uh, lampreys. Uh, some of, uh, so here is a hagfish, all right? Um, and uh, then uh, next we'll have a uh, lamprey. Um, so they did not have teeth. Um, the placoderm, um, uh, the uh, placoderm uh, jawed uh, fishes did not have teeth, although they could have skull bones in the mouth area, which were sharp and could function as teeth in grabbing uh, prey. Nevertheless, they did not have uh, teeth. Um, uh, it may be that the first sharks did not have teeth because um, uh, their scales are found uh, before there are any teeth. So here we see placoderms. Those would not be teeth. Those just would be skull bones in the vicinity of uh, the uh, mouth. Um, but then after the very first sharks, uh, then there were true teeth uh, with layers of enamel and dentin, uh, which uh, surrounded a pulp cavity. So teeth came um, uh, later in vertebrate uh, evolution. Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, sharks are the most primitive uh, group uh, uh, that alive that have teeth. And the fascinating thing is if you ask where did teeth come from? Well, the scales of sharks are called placoid scales. And if you've ever you know, touched a shark, uh, you know that their skin is uh, raspy. It's kind of like sandpaper. And this is because uh, that each scale has enamel and dentin in it. So these scales are made of tooth stuff. So before there were teeth, there were scales made of tooth stuff, enamel and dentin. And so it would appear that uh, then uh, 
uh, the scales in the vicinity of the mouth then became bigger for prey capture. And this is then the origin of uh, teeth that they came uh, from the placoid scales of uh, early vertebrates, which were made of uh, enamel and dentin. Now, teeth certainly uh, vary. Uh, so uh, a lot of the fish uh, and uh, even the first amphibians and reptiles had fangs in the roof of their mouth, not from uh, the uh, uh, maxilla and uh, the dentary, uh, but from other bones like the vomer in the roof of the mouth. Um, and so that was the early ancestral condition. And every now and then you can ask your dentist, um, and a person has a tooth forming in the roof of their mouth, which could be a problem and has to be uh, removed. Um, even in groups uh, where we, uh, we you know, associate you know, one type of tooth structure. So for example, you know, the theropod dinosaurs, they were predators, so they would have had you know, you know, sharp pointy teeth. Um, certainly we can see variations. Some are thicker, which would you know, maybe even allow them to, uh, uh, to eat a bone. Uh, some were thinner, perhaps an adaptation for grabbing uh, fish. Uh, some of the theropod dinosaurs actually lost their teeth and had no teeth. Some had lots of blunt teeth. So one of the things, if you were to study one group, even the theropod dinosaurs, which we associate with, um, uh, with uh, you know, uh, being predators, you know, whether it be thick teeth on T-Rex or toothless uh, structures in the ornithomimids um, uh, to uh, Pelicanomimus, which had uh, 200 uh, uh, teeth, um, very uh, small uh, blunter uh, teeth. Uh, there are certainly uh, variations uh, here. Uh, and it's interesting to note of teeth. So for example, uh, when we think of the big sauropods, you know, you know clearly they were uh, herbivorous, uh, but interestingly, they do not have cheek teeth, you know, molars, premolars, you know, we, you know, once again, getting back to it, uh, I tell, ask my students, you know, um, you know who else ch uh, choose their food? Most vertebrates don't. And so here, uh, these sauropods, they didn't have chewing teeth uh, in the sides of their mouth. So their teeth were just ad adapted to strip leaves or maybe to grab aquatic uh, vegetation that their long necks could help them uh, uh, reach. And then they would have to do you know, this grinding uh, in uh, the rest of their GI tract, not in uh, their mouths. There was one group of, uh, of dinosaurs, the ornithicians, actually, and two separate lineages of those. Uh, so the uh, ornithopods, like the duck-billed dinosaurs and the horned dinosaurs, they actually did evolve the ability to chew. So if you ask what groups of animals chew their food, mammals and these two groups of ornithician dinosaurs those would be the only groups that really got good at uh, chewing uh, uh, food. These um, ornithicians, uh, they would increase the number of teeth over time. They would increase the number of rows of teeth so that there were multiple rows exposed at one time. They lost the teeth in the front of their jaws so their tip of their jaw would have had a horny beak to, uh, to grab food material. And then um, uh, they had this dental battery where they had lots of teeth cemented uh, together and then even multiple rows of teeth, which would allow them to grind plant uh, materials. So uh, late in the Mesozoic era, the um, hadrosaurs were very good at chewing food. The uh, horn dinosaurs would have been very good at slicing food with a similar um, dental battery, but more for slicing rather than grinding. And that would have allowed the horned dinosaurs to take advantage of, uh, of uh, some thicker plants, uh, uh, such as the cycads, which were common at that time. And so we could look at lineages of, um, of animals and talk about how uh, the teeth have varied. Certainly in birds, we see teeth in the earliest birds. Birds lose their teeth, um, but birds still contain the genes to make teeth, and they're actually uh, mutant lines of chickens which can make uh, uh, teeth. Um, but to focus on mammals, um, teeth became very important in mammals uh, to support being warm-blooded. Right? Once again, being warm-blooded and having a bigger brain, holding your body off the ground, none of these come cheap. 
And so you're going to have to be able to support this. And so the teeth of mammals, you know, tear up their food so uh, thoroughly that uh, it allows all of the nutrients uh, to be taken uh, advantage of, as opposed to say turtles or crocodiles, which are rather inefficient in their um, in their digestion. But once again, because it doesn't take that many calories to run the body of a turtle or a um, or an alligator, um, they can afford to be uh, in uh, efficient. And so, in these synapsid reptiles, ending with the cynodonts, we see gradual. Uh, transformations to becoming uh, mammalian. And so uh, we can see that um, they uh, develop that secondary uh, uh, palate. Um, they uh, then uh, develop uh, chewing teeth, all right? So they have different kinds of teeth, incisors, then uh, canines, uh, then premolars, then molars, which is different than most animals. Most animals just have teeth. Right, so if you think of an alligator, there's sharp pointy teeth in the front of the jaw, sharp pointy teeth in the rear of the jaw. It would be these mam uh, mammal ancestors which get the different kinds of teeth. And once again, as they were becoming warm blooded, they needed to you know, provide more calories to support this uh, higher uh, metabolism. Um, and uh, as uh, I'll go through in the next, uh, uh, item. Uh, one of the defining uh, features of uh, the mammals uh, was that they stopped replacing their teeth all throughout uh, their, uh, their lives. Um, and so uh, going back, uh, teeth, you know, uh, are important. The mammals get different kinds of teeth. Uh, and, you know, incisors, uh, canines, premolars, and molars. And then the cheek teeth allow them to chew their food. So notice that this great blue heron, it isn't chewing its food, it's just swallowing. Notice that this condor isn't chewing its food, you know, it's just tearing and swallowing. And then birds will do some of the grinding in a gizzard. Uh, notice that this alligator, you know, just has sharp pointy teeth. They don't touch each other. Here are those you know, teeth in the roof of the mouth that I mentioned that some fish have, but would also be present in early amphibians and uh, reptiles. And so um, when you look at the teeth of most animals, uh, they're not for chewing and they don't touch each other, all right? So when the mouth is closed, it's not like there are matching surfaces in the upper and lower teeth. But the mammals, in order to power their metabolisms, they needed to have what's called occlusion so that when the uh, upper and lower uh, jaws uh, were closed, that there would be matching surfaces and that food could be just ripped apart on the surfaces uh, between them. And so uh, this evolved in the uh, earliest, uh, in the ancestors of mammals. But when you look at, you know, say this horse, so it has not only chewing teeth, but there is occlusion. All right, the teeth touch each other when the mouth is closed and they have matching surfaces. And this allows you know, this to really rip up the grass so that all of the nutrients can be made, uh, taken advantage of. The same is true here on uh, this mastodon. Notice the matching surfaces on the upper lower teeth. The same on uh, the, uh, the pig, look at the matching surfaces. Uh, here's a, uh, a carnivore known as a fisher or a grizzly, um, or a baboon. And so uh, mammals evolved tooth occlusion uh, so that their teeth would touch um, and that they had matching surfaces. And this once again would allow them to better tear up their food so that you could support a huge animal like this on fairly nutrient poor material. Grass doesn't have you know, a large, uh, uh, amount of nutrients, but if you can take advantage of all of the material, like really ripping up uh, the, um, the material, then that changes uh, that. Um, and so uh, mammals get tooth occlusion. Uh, obviously, different lineages of mammals do different things with teeth, including making some into tusks. So the tusks of elephants are really just uh, enlarged um, incisor uh, teeth and you can go from the earliest el elephants you know to look at you know where they are just essentially big teeth to where um, 
and they become, uh, you know, these tusks. Some elephants had, you know, these uh, tusks in their upper jaws, their lower jaws. When we think of ivory, it sounds so exotic, but if ivory is just enamel, you have ivory on your, um, uh, on uh, your uh, teeth. And, uh, uh, you know, the study of teeth can be important. So when you look at the mastodon, it seems so different from a modern elephant or a mammoth. And this was actually for a while, it was thought that mastodons and mammoths were the same type of elephant. Um, and, uh, but then it was uh, Cuvier, the uh, kind of the father of comparative anatomy, um, who said, wait, no, we have two different kinds of elephants here. And uh, he thought, you know, just to make a comparison, that uh, these teeth, they had lobes which resembled breasts. And so he named this elephant the mastodon, don referring to teeth, mast referring to breast. So this is the breast tooth. Um, and the uh, observation was an important one because the mastodons are an earlier group of elephants. Um, they evolved when uh, the world was warmer and moister and forests were more common. Uh, later, as the ice ages were approaching, the world became cooler and drier and grasslands spread. And so the elephants which evolved later, like mammoths and the elephants we have today, they have a different kind of tooth for grinding grass. They are grazing elephants as opposed to the mastodon, which is a browsing uh, elephant. Uh, and the teeth, you know, show us that the type of uh, food uh, that um, they are adapted to. Other lineage is, lineages of uh, mammals were adapting their teeth to tear meat. And so they have carnassial teeth, which are good for tearing uh, meat. Um, now, one of the earlier groups of carnivorous mammals, uh, the uh, creodonts, including you know, some subdivisions, their carnassial teeth for tearing meat were a little farther back in the mouth. And this apparently limited them. So their carnassial teeth being a little farther back in the mouth meant that they couldn't really specialize molars um, for eating other types of diet. So while they were, um, while they were carnivores, they would become extinct when uh, the dogs and bears and cats evolved. And one of the things about the dogs and cats and bears is their tearing teeth, the carnassial teeth are a little farther um, forward in the mouth, uh, which perhaps allows some, like for example, bears, to not only uh, um, you know, tear meat, but then have a, a, a more diverse uh, uh, things in uh, their diet. So, you know, here's another modification of teeth. Uh, you know, you can have carnassials uh, for, uh, for tearing um, uh, meat, uh, and that can vary uh, in uh, different uh, groups. So we could see this in all uh, mammals, but let's go to um, uh, the primates. Um, as primate groups evolved, there is uh, a group of primates known as the catarine primates, which include the old world monkeys and not the new world monkeys. Uh, so the new world monkeys and old world monkeys uh, would be part of the anthropoid primates. And if you ask, well, how could you identify a fossil of a catarine primate, uh, one of the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the first uh, changes uh, was that a premolar was lost. So we could talk about a dental formula and list, if there are different kinds of teeth, how many of each kind. Uh, the first mammals had a lot. Right? So if we look at some of the first mammals, you know, they could have four incisors, um, uh, three premolars, four molars. So when you look at an opossum or when you look at these early mammals, they certainly had a lot of, uh, of teeth. Um, but now when you look at um, you know, the primates, there are two incisors. Once again, the first mammals had more. There is one canine. There are three premolars and there are um, uh, uh, three molars. And once again, just to compare here to the opossum, look, five incisors, canines, three premolars, molars. And so there was a reduction from uh, the number of teeth and the first mammals had more. Uh, so the first primates then have a tooth formula of two, one, three, three. And you could write that two comma one comma three comma three slash two comma one comma three comma three, meaning uh, this is the formula on the upper jaw slash this is the formula 
on the lower jaw. But then uh, this would, uh, tooth formula also applies uh, to um, uh, the New World monkeys from South America. But if you were to look at the Old World monkeys, like the vervet monkey or the apes, there are no longer three premolars, there are just two. So the tooth formula is now two comma one comma two comma three. And so one of the ways of recognizing the catarine uh, primates was a change in uh, the tooth formula where one of the ancestral um, uh, premolars uh, was uh, lost. Right. And so I have just another video where I explain that. Um, as uh, the human lineage specifically adapted, one of the chain, uh, we see a couple of changes in the teeth. Uh, one is that the enamel became thicker, all right? And as the planet dried, then uh, apparently humans were spending. So as the world became warmer and, I'm sorry, cooler and drier, uh, the forest gave way to savannas. And so then human ancestors would have spent less time in trees and more time on the, gra uh, on the ground, where in grasslands, you know, with the roots, the food, uh, the food would have been more fibrous. And so as the uh, hominins uh, evolved, the enamel layer in their teeth becomes thicker. So in uh, chimps, uh, the layer of enamel is thinner than what we see in humans. In uh, the uh, early hominins, uh, the enamel has an intermediate uh, thickness. Uh, one other uh, difference we can see in the, um, uh, the hominins is that the canines uh, were uh, reduced. And so obviously canines can be big. We know from you know, dogs, obviously, uh, but also if you, if you look at you know, gorillas, uh, chimps, orangutans, uh, the canines are large. And then this, you know, when animals fight, when you know, males you know, display uh, aggression, uh, these are very prominent um, uh, potential uh, weapons. Um, these canines were reduced in the human uh, lineage, which you know, might strike you. Why, when you're coming out of the trees and now coming on the ground, uh, why would you now lose these potential weapons if now the ground might have all these potential predators? Um, and the answer is, once again, if chewing becomes more important, say chewing fibrous uh, material, um, then these big canines are getting in the way. They make you less efficient at chewing if you've got these really big uh, canines. And uh, the brain, which was becoming larger in, um, uh, in uh, these hominins, would need more nutrients. And so the argument would be that you would not be able to provide sufficient nutrition to this, you know, be, uh, this uh, brain becoming larger if you were limiting your ability to chew and then living in an area where, you know, whether it be more fibrous plant material or seeds or roots, uh, you would need an increased ability to chew in order to get uh, the nutrients uh, uh, from them. And so unlike the, um, uh, the uh, canines, which we see in the uh, uh, the chimps and the gorillas, as we start looking at the Australopithecines, et cetera, the canines are uh, reduced a bit bigger than ours at first. Uh, but once again, this seems to have been important. And then, you know, apart from digestion, we could argue, you know, uh, this probably was very important as far as, you know, group dynamics, you know, as far as, um, you know, the loss of these, uh, you know, uh, threatening uh, weapons. And so, uh, once again, we chew our food. We have that um, a synapse and opening in the skull marked by this um, zygomatic arch through which jaw muscles can have. And the fish, the amphibians, the first reptile did not have that, but later uh, uh, ones evolved those, uh, uh, these openings uh, to allow jaw muscle uh, to uh, lengthen. Um, and uh, this then was uh, significant. These chewing muscles are important. And you can see in some like in gorillas or even some early uh, hominins like Australopithecus, uh, Australopithecus boise, um, there's a ridge on the top of the skull where these big chewing muscles can attach.
Uh, we have salivary glands, uh, which are exocrine glands, uh, which uh, release the products of you know, uh, saliva into the oral cavity from a parotid gland, a submandibular gland, a sublingual gland. And so we actually begin digestion in the mouth. Most animals, food doesn't stay in the mouth very long. All right, so, you know, chomp, chomp and swallow, getting back to a frog or an alligator or a bird. Whereas we keep food in our mouths a bit where we tear it up so that as, you know, this uh, material hits the digestive enzymes, the cells are ripped apart and all of their, you know, organic molecules will be available for digestion. If you look at our teeth, they are inset. That creates a cheek. Most animals don't have cheeks. If you look at like an alligator, the teeth are right on the surface of the, uh, right on the edge of the, the face. Um, because once again, food is not going to be kept in the mouth. Whereas, you know, that is our uh, intent. We have a very muscular tongue, so much more muscular than the tongues of, you know, say fish. Um, and so uh, in our oral uh, cavity, uh, food spends a while going from the cheek to the oral cavity. We have a tongue moving it around. It can go to different parts, uh, different types of teeth. We have teeth for tearing in the front of the jaws, uh, teeth for uh, chewing uh, in the back of the jaws. And after all of this is uh, then, um, uh, then uh, done, uh, we have now a mushy bolus of food that we can then push to the back of our mouths. Um, in this part of our GI tract, we have that skeletal muscle. So this is still under voluntary control. Um, but once we swallow this bolus and it goes into the oropharynx, then the laryngopharynx, and then the esophagus, here we have um, and then smooth muscle and reflexes uh, take over. Uh, so once again, um, not only is it important for vertebrates uh, to uh, eat, um, but it's especially important for we mammals because of how expensive we are. We would not be warm blooded or have big brains or walk upright if our digestive systems couldn't provide the calories that power these very expensive, uh, expensive uh, things. And so, um, you know, as much as we take the mouth and things like chewing for granted, it's actually quite, you know, special. And, you know, mammals have a number of adaptations. And so as you look at the, um, uh, the changes which we see in the oral cavity uh, over uh, time, they've been gradual, uh, but certainly uh, the success of the mammals uh, alive uh, today is in large part uh, because of you know, all of these, uh, uh, these uh, changes. Uh, the next video uh, will, here's monkey, you can see how big and muscular the tongue uh, is. Um, and then uh, the um, uh, next video uh, will uh, pick up with this bolus of food at it, as it is swallowed and then follow its progress uh, through uh, the remainder of the digestive uh, tract.